Yo, what's up with y'all, man? I hope you're doing good. If you're new and you're a fan of the NBA, subscribe to this channel. So let's get straight into it. Just like it's mini May, high tech four, running gay, 24, number eight, coach, fade away, all this is 11 grade, still in school, let them hate. So the 2020 2021 NBA season starts today, which means that all the rookies that we've been eyeing career starts pretty much today as well. But before we start this vibe worthy video, per usual, I have a question, and hopefully I answer that question by myself once this video ends. Now my question was, a question that I have pretty much every year, but I don't voice it that much, is which of these rookies are in the best and worst situations to start out their NBA career? Now, let me go ahead and elaborate for some of you who are kind of confused about that question. When I say best or worst, I'm meaning which of these rookies will be able to not only elevate their team, but also their progression as a player by having certain things around them so they can go ahead and grow and flourish as smoothly as possible. And the easiest way to answer that question is by figuring out which of these players have a great balance of these two things. The two things being opportunity and situation. Situation. Those two things are vital and key for any young player. It doesn't matter how talented or gifted you are. If your situation or opportunity isn't right at the start of your NBA career, you're not going to get off to a great start in the league until these two things get figured out. Perfect example is Devin Booker and Donovan Mitchell. Oh wait, hold on. I feel like I've said that exact same line before. Deja Vu. Two perfect examples are the two are debatable best young shooting guards in the NBA today. Donovan Mitchell and Devin Booker. Both players are extremely young, extremely talented, and are the best players on their team. The one thing that obviously separates the two is their situation. d -Mitch was the best player these last two years on that Utah team. A Utah team that made the playoffs. He was the leader, the top scorer. He was basically the life of that team. Meanwhile, in Phoenix, bro, I don't even know if there is a life over there, period. Things have been extremely dead in Phoenix for years now. If you want to find out why and just find out all the little ticky tack details i made a video on that a while ago check it out but anyways things have been dead in phoenix and that's to no fault of devin book he literally can't do nothing about it but improve his game donovan mitchell literally did nothing to be put in this magnificent situation in utah it's just something that happens you know in utah it was an easy plug and play meanwhile in phoenix yeah it's plug but it ain't no real play over there these two guys are great but the only reason why you may think one of them has the edge over the other is ultimately the point of this entire video their situation yeah i've been through this before but an even newer and better example is comparing trey young to john ja Morant. an overwhelming amount of people believe that john ja Morant is a better player and when asked as to why they think that in the first place they say oh he wins more he's won more than 30 games in his nba career which is definitely factual and no lies were told in that last statement that i just said but it's not a fair thing to bring up at all in an nba discussion or argument what jaw has over trey which is the only reason why some people think that Jaw is better is because of his team organization. Both had equal opportunity, but the quality of each team and the coach is vastly different, which is just hurting Trey Young in general when it comes to ranking him as a player. His team sucked. They were booty butt cheek buns. What do you want him to do about it, yo? Trey Young did nothing to have his team suck, and John Moran did literally nothing to have his team become so good as soon as he stepped into the league. It's just a blessing. You either have it or you don't. Simple as that. That's just an example as to why this video right here is so important. Lamella Ball is easily in one of the best, possibly the best situation of them all. The Charlotte Hornets were a team that was just looking for someone, something to pop off and to give their organization and fans some type of guidance. Now, Devontae Graham was that last year, but his potential, as we all know, is limited due to his frame and size. And we need more of a dominating presence and figure. They needed more of one. They needed someone to present to your fans to let them know that everything was going to be all right and that they're in good hands. And Lamella Ball is exactly exactly is that. He is a security blanket for the Hornets and will assure them that they aren't irrelevant. Only a select amount of players, a select amount of talents and prospects in the entire world can provide that. We only get one or two of those per year, maybe if we're lucky. So it's clear as day that the opportunity is there, but what about the situation? The Hornets and Michael Jordan is not going to let no Terry Rozier 
be in the way of letting LaMelo Ball glow and flourish in the league. And because of that, like I said, his opportunity is great. But what about his situation? Uh, well, to be honest, the Hornets aren't a horrible team and have a lot of pieces that fit next to LaMelo. The piece that I'm most excited to watch play alongside LaMelo Ball is Miles Bridges. Miles Bridges is exactly the type of 4-3 that LaMelo Ball loves to play with. This man is a slasher and he rises above the rim to go ahead and slam dunk on your favorite team. Their little duo and their ongoing great chemistry is what's going to make the Hornets exciting. Now, outside of that, I love Devontae Graham's fit alongside LaMelo Ball. I feel like as the season goes on, they're going to play alongside of each other and they're going to feed off of each other really well. Since they both can't shoot, Devontae Graham is more of a shooter right now compared to LaMelo Ball, but they both are very capable shooters and some of the best passers or one of the better passers in the NBA at least. And then when it comes to the rest of their roster, Gordon Herod, of course, he's very injury prone. He just like broke one of his fingers. Once he gets back healthy, of course, he's a great fit on the court alongside just about anybody in the NBA. NBA. He has virtually no glaring holes in his game. He can shoot a solid defender, solid rebounder, he can pass the ball, and also he's very versatile on the court. Whatever you want him to do, he can pretty much do at a respectable rate. Then there's guys like PJ Washington, who was a very quality second, maybe third year player now in the NBA. And of course, their big man, Cody Zeller, the yeller, you're a real one if you get that reference. With all that being said about LaMelo Ball in this icy, so cold, great situation, I ain't gonna lie, I'm gonna have to say that he is in one of the best situations, period, in the NBA. It's not gonna be nice or convenient for LaMelo Ball to be good for the Sean Horse this season. No, they're going to need him absolutely to be good. And that right there is something that I sadly cannot say about Anthony Edwards just because of the team that he got picked by, the Timberwolves. Anthony Edwards is a tough one to decide because he's on a good team that has a good situation ongoing for the most part. They have a lot of players that fit well together, but I cannot see Anthony getting a lot of shots or opportunities just so easily because they just paid that maniac named Malik Beasley a big bag, and I ain't gonna lie, he's not only crazy off the court, but on the court, he's something different too. Man, this is a bona fide shooter and a great offensive player who's just too good to sit on the bench for right now until Anthony Edwards has something to say about it. Nothing will change about that until Anthony Edwards proves his defensive versatility proves that he can be a great secondary passer and also a good shot maker as well but long story short at the end of the day to come to a conclusion whatever ending that you want he is in a good spot his peak in the nba is being the third best player on a championship team max second option which is what he is it'll just take a good amount of time for him to break through because beasley is just not no scrub he's in one of the best situations i just can't see him winning rookie of the year or piling on too many accolades or maybe even even making hella all-star appearances like LaMelo Ball will. Next up is James Wiseman. I'm pretty sure that we can keep this short and that's for known reasons. Man is playing with Steph Curry, Draymond Green, and he has a Klay Thompson who will be praised up for Klay again back once again next season. He's in a really good situation. The great thing about the Warriors is that in the next three to four, maybe five years, they're going to be a rebuilding team once again. And James Wiseman could be in the forefront of that if he just goes ahead and proves all the naysayers about him wrong and shows a little bit of ball him a little bit of shot making not only from the mid range but the three point line too and just be the next freak as a lot of people are still kind of crazy label him at because of clay thompson being out the warriors are going to need someone like wiseman to just do a little bit more than rim running getting rebounds blocking shots he should be asked to do a little bit more than that and because of that he's also in one of the best situations as well the next prospect that a lot of people have been in love with recently is patrick williams now he's a good player and he's going to have a great rookie season will have opportunity but there's one thing and one thing only that's gonna make me say that this man may not reach his full potential in the NBA and that's because of the Chicago Bulls if you're a young player on the Chicago Bulls though, this is what it seems like at least I'm sorry Bulls fan your young player is not gonna get what he deserves in the NBA Zach Levine he's a great example man should have been an all-star like last year and I believe that he should be an all-star this year once he goes out and proves to y'all what I am predicting right now. He's missing out on not only a lot of money, but accolades because his team really sucks. And I can see something of that nature happening to Patrick Williams. Man is a man is a stud on the court, loves his mid-range jumper, plays elite defense, and is a good finisher around the rim. He's great. Everybody loves this type of player, but the media and when it comes to how they classify players 
at the end of the day, when it comes to the wins and loss column, they're going to think that he's mid or that he's just not that great. And for that, I'm saying that he is in a bad situation, but that's to no fault of his own. He literally has no control of any of that. The Bulls just have not proved themselves yet to be a responsible and respectable organization in quite a while. But hopefully, that'll change soon. The next man up is Big O on the Atlanta Hawks. Because of our front court situation, there isn't much opportunity out there for him yet. But because of the situation and because of what a lot of people are speculating, out there that John Collins may be traded even though I think Clint Capella may be traded we're gonna have Big O start for us at the five spot one day regardless of the fact a lot of people are speculating that he's not gonna get a lot of opportunity just yet but maybe next year or year three into his NBA career so he's in a good situation a great situation but the opportunity just isn't there yet for him I can trust them unlike the Chicago Bulls. Next up is Obi Toppin. Now here's the thing, I like Obi Toppin and over in the past in this channel it may have seemed like I hated him. I don't hate anybody, I don't hate any prospects, but one thing that I do love about Obi Toppin is his fit on the New York Knicks. It's perfect. He fits the timeline and the main characters of the New York Knicks story in the making, but then again, I know why they are the Knicks and the Knicks do Nick things that make you scratch your head 24-7. But this past offseason, I can't lie, they have been doing a pretty solid job. But I'm not sure how good or credible that is to say because I'm just saying that because they didn't do anything too stupid at all. And that is bare minimum in the NBA today. So for now, just for now, I'm going to say that he's in a bad situation. The Knicks are going to have to prove to me in the next two to three years that they're actually a respectable organization and not do stupid things. An organization known for doing stupid things notoriously also are the Cleveland Cavaliers. And the next prospect up that I'm talking about is Isaac Okoro. Now this may be a prospect that I wish that I did more research on and also talked about positively at least and more in depth on my channel for sure. He's a great prospect, better than I thought he would be, but his team is poor though. And because of that, I think his situation is poor as well. Something that really caught my eye and really made me question the Cavaliers, again, as an organization, is pretty sus things that were said about him and questioned about him as well. Someone, a part of the Cleveland Cavaliers organization, questioned whether or not he can play the wing position, two, three, or maybe even four nowadays in the NBA. I don't know, like, what is the thought process of going in between this? Like, did you just start watching basketball today? Because anybody, literally anybody, could have answered that for you in the quickest way possible. So them even doing that already scares the living hell out of me, and it kind of sucks to see that he is going to have to go through some type of struggle in order to shine as bright as his peers and he's going to have to bust his behind in order to be mentioned as a good player. So he's in a poor situation if you ask me. Another wing that I was hot and cold on is Denny Abdiya. That man is in a great situation and he also has great opportunity to go ahead and flourish in the NBA. Now I don't think Denny Abdiya is the type of prospect that you'd want to go ahead and give the full key to your offense and your organization, but he's the type certainly that you'd expect to work his way up and earn his respect rather than just giving it to him because he was a college or in this case international sensation. Then he has one of the best players, two of the best players in the NBA in Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook, former MVP, to go ahead and look towards when it comes to advice and just how to play the game of basketball in general. So that's great and that's something that literally none of these rookies have on their team and Denny's knowledge of the game can be next level. The last prospect that I'm going to talk about right now is one of my favorite again, Cole Anthony. I have been saying over and over and over and over again, I even made a video about how this man could be the steal of the NBA draft and he's really slept on because of all the BS that he went through back in college. He's in a great situation and just like LaMelo Ball, his organization will only go as far as Cole Anthony can take. He is the most important component on that roster. I don't give a damn when nobody tells me I don't care I don't care if Cole Anthony ends up being mid then the Orlando Magic two three years from now depending on how they do in the NBA draft and stuff like that will be a mid organization as well if Cole Anthony is going to be a star after being 20 23 24 25 points per game in the NBA one day are gonna be towards the top of the league once again the situation is great because they have so many season vets alongside a combination of good young players and mentioning speaking of good young players Markel Fultz he just got paid the bag congratulations Congratulations to him, but I want you guys to make sure and take note that it's not a crazy long-term bag or a four-year deal. It's only a three-year deal, I believe. And I think that Cole Anthony, everybody in this organization and these fans should be well aware that he can easily 
take Markel's fourth spot as the starting point guard and I believe Foles will be perfectly fine with that. The type of money that he just got isn't the type of money that makes you super secure with your spot on the organization. What's understood over there in Orlando doesn't have to be said. This is the end of the video though man, I really really, oh whoops, do appreciate you for coming over here on my channel and seeing as I was trying to say before my camera rudely turned off, this is the end of the video though man, I really really do appreciate you watching this video right now for coming over here on my channel and seeing what I have to talk about today. That is, as usual, extremely dope you and I don't think you understand how crazy that is that you're watching me talk about basketball. I'm just like you. It's just that I like to talk in front of my camera and I like and I like to post it on the internet for everybody to see and possibly make fun of me on the internet for my opinions. Don't really care and I didn't really ask. But anyway, Anyways, outside of everything that I just said, also, I need you to go ahead and leave a like, comment, share, subscribe, because I'm about to be going crazy, as usual. But um, outside of everything that I just said, I just really, really do hope that you make your day great. Subscribe to Yo Mojo. I'm going to be uploading there every other day. And subscribe or follow me on Instagram. Until then, I'll get right with you. Tell my girl who that